Confessions of a Spanish Teacher Part 14 Chapter 22 Nightmare Summer School Pesadilla de la Escuela de Verano Things carried on. The school was busy enough and I was managing to pay the receptionist, the rent, electricity, etc. However, summer was approaching and it was the first summer I was having to do this alone. I was panicking as I knew that Spanish classes get very quiet in the summer due to the intense heat and that many of my students went back to their country for the summer or had family out here to stay. Unfortunately, my expenses did not reduce in the summer, so somehow I had to think of a way to keep the cash flow consistent through this difficult period. I came up with the idea of a summer school for children aged 5 to 16, to learn both Spanish and practice their English reading and writing. Many British children that are brought up here in Spain, my own son included, know how to speak English, but they struggle to read it or spell it, as they are in the Spanish state system and they read and spell phonetically in the Spanish way. So I printed up some leaflets, set a price and a limit of 20 students divided into two classes and I took on a couple of temporary teachers to help me out. The places filled almost immediately and we were ready to go for July and half of August. What could go wrong? The first thing I want to say is that I have to give a massive round of applause for any teacher in any normal school that has to deal with large class sizes and difficult children. Actually, much more difficult than the children are the parents. <clears throat> I came to realise that many parents look on any kind of school as a glorified babysitter. Many of the parents of my students parked their kids and went off to spend the day in the pub. They were no help whatsoever and in fact more of a hindrance in supporting any behavioural issue their kids might have. I learned that saying that they have a few learning difficulties could also be translated to they are in fact a sociopath one step from Borstal. Also I found that despite repeatedly asking the parents to send in only healthy snacks and drinks. Often it would just be a bar of chocolate and a can of Coke or a packet of crisps, as if they weren't hyperactive enough. Some were even sent in with money to pop and get something from the bar downstairs. Half a lager and a packet of pork scratchings. And who was supposed to accompany them there when all the teachers were occupied with class? Or we were, were we supposed to let them go to the bar alone and just hope they weren't abducted? We were either too strict or we were not strict enough. Why didn't I let them out to play? Uh, sorry, we didn't let them out to play enough or we shouldn't let them out to play in the heat. They did too much writing or they did too many activities. We just couldn't win. But if all that wasn't difficult enough, it wasn't quite as scary as the day, the day that one of my teachers decided to do glass plating, uh, painting with the students in the afternoon, which was taken, the afternoons were always taken up with more fun activities. The heat was building, so the mornings were reserved for more formal classes, afternoons for fun and games. One of the students, named James, was nine years old. Again, not his real name. He was a nice lad, but he had some health problems and learning difficulties, and as a result of this, behavioural problems. His mother had warned us, but in fact he had actually fitted in well, and he was one of our favourites, as he was in fact very endearing and very sweet. All the students, especially like the Spanish teacher Carolina, she had such a lovely way with children. That fateful day, she had decided to do some glass painting with the children. They had all brought in a glass jar or a bottle and she was showing them how to blow paint from a straw to make patterns. 
when I look back on it now, I can see it was a recipe for disaster. But I pleaded innocence, as in fact, I was in another classroom teaching adults. And I didn't actually know what was happening until the receptionist burst into my classroom in a panic to ask what she should do. Apparently, James had sucked in the paint instead of blowing it out. And then he had immediately started to convulse his eyes rolling back in his head. That is how I found him in the, on the sofa in reception. Twitching, foaming at the mouth, his very slender little body convulsing, his heartbeat terrifyingly erratic and only the whites of his eyes to be seen. A very, very scary scenario. We needed medical help and soon. Part two, chapter 23. Absolute panic ensued, but we quickly established that the paint was non-toxic, so we had no idea why this might have happened. I ran 112, the equivalent of 999, and requested an ambulance immediately. I have, of, I have often said, and I truly believe, that the Spanish health system is fantastic. And I feel lucky to be living here with the marvellous facilities we have. However, one thing I've learned is it's not a good idea to get ill in July or August, as a huge influx of tourists in this area stretches these facilities to breaking point. I was told that there were no ambulances immediately available, but when I explained the situation, they said they would try their best. So we tried without success to contact James's mother, who had her phone switched off. James was still fitting and unconscious on the sofa, and I was really convinced that he would die before the ambulance got there. Finally, after what seemed hours, but actually was only about 20 minutes, a guy came rushing in and said he was there to take James to hospital. There were a few issues with this. One... The guy was only a driver, not a paramedic, and in fact he was not trained in any way. He had just been called in to help in the busy holiday period. Two, he was alone, so we had to get James down the stairs on a stretcher between us. Three, the fantastic local hospital we now have had not yet been built and the nearest hospital was in fact 30 miles away. When I saw the antiquated ambulance that awaited us, I realised it would probably take more like 45 minutes to get to the hospital. As he had no helper with him and we had not been able to contact James's mum, I had to accompany James so he was not alone in the back. We got him down the stairs on a stretcher and onto the back and I cl climbed in also. We set off. It was hot and stifling. There was no aircon in the very old ambulance and James was still twitching. He was unconscious and very pale. As we drove to the hospital, we seemed to go over every bump on the road. Suddenly, about halfway there, James had a very violent convulsion. His eyes rolled back in his head and suddenly went limp. And it didn't look as if he was breathing. I panicked and told the driver this. He drove faster and finally we arrived at the hospital. I was so relieved that we would finally see a doctor and also to see James was in fact breathing, though still unconscious. I got out of the ambulance and they rushed to the door to take James out on the stretcher. As they did so, in their haste, they jolted the stretcher against the side of the ambulance door and James's eyes opened. He looked bewildered and dazed, wondering where he was, but he was not convulsing anymore. Fifteen minutes later, he was sat up in bed on a ward as if nothing had happened, and the doctor was testily asking me why I had called an ambulance when he was obviously fine. Another 15 minutes later and the mother arrived, also 
seemingly a little bit annoyed that she'd been dragged away from whatever she was doing when he was sat up in bed chatting away and seemed perfectly okay. James himself could remember nothing of the experience and he could not back me up. He was given the usual test but nothing was amiss. So he was discharged almost immediately and everyone seemed to blame me for wasting their time. Needless to say, there was no more glass painting in class. The following summer, I reduced the hours of the summer school and increased the price. And as a result, the students that came were much more serious about learning Spanish and the parents much less inclined to treat it as just a dumping ground for their children while they went to the pub. And that summer, the second summer and last summer school that I did, passed uneventfully. Chapter 24. Viaje de Desastre al Palacio de Benidorm. The disastrous trip to Benidorm Palace. Many of my students were asking me about what there was to do around the area and for some unknown reason I decided to organise a trip to Benidorm Palace which is a great venue for a show and a nice meal. Benidorm, Benidorm is not too far away from here and I organised a coach to take us. Almost 90 people signed up to come along. In those days, I was still perhaps rather naive in relying on organizational, organizational skills of other companies in Spain. I booked Benidorm Palace for us and we were scheduled to leave at six o'clock in, uh, in the afternoon. Oh, Jesus, excuse me. And arrive in plenty of time for the meal, which would begin at nine. Everyone arrived outside the academy on time and all we needed was for the bus to arrive so that we could be on our way. Ten minutes passed. Another ten. No sign of the bus. There was no internet those days, no what or limited internet, no WhatsApp, no Facebook. So I had to go into my building and start looking for numbers to try and find out what had happened to the bus. Finally, I got through to the office and they contacted the driver to see where he was. So it transpired he was in a double-decker coach. The coach would not fill under, uh, fit under the archway that you had to pass through to come down to the academy. So he was waiting at the end of the road and he had been waiting there for 30 minutes. For some unexplained reason, he must have thought that we would all know this by osmosis and he hadn't found the need to actually ring the office or me to let us know. So off we all plodded to the end of the road to find the bus waiting for us out of sight. When I say the driver was surly and uncooperative, I'm painting a nice picture. He was a miserable, awkward twonk and he proceeded to do anything he could to make the journey as slow and difficult as possible. He had a lady companion with him on the bus, which I found out later was strictly not allowed and was most likely his mistress. Anyone who, anyone who has travelled on a bus in this part of Spain will know that it's an experience not to be forgotten. I have been present on a coach filled with disabled children where the driver got drunk in the lunch break. I have travelled by bus from my little village into town when the driver was talking non-stop on his mobile. And after a run-in with a bus driver who seemed to think my car was badly parked outside my own house, I was asked by the policy or locale just to humour him as everyone knows how difficult and awkward bus drivers are. However, I didn't know all this then. I was just thinking, oh, well, at least we've got plenty of time and at least we're on our way now. The next problem occurred when I realised he wasn't going to go on the motorway. 
he was taking the coast road, which would take at least 30 minutes longer. I challenged him on this and he said he wasn't allowed to take the motorway right from the start as the bus company wouldn't pay the multiple toll fees, only the main one that couldn't be avoided. Great. The journey continued. We all started to relax a bit as we were well and truly on our way and we should arrive within an hour and a half. When we finally got onto the motorway, I really relaxed as within 40 minutes we should have arrived. That's when disaster struck. Smoke started to come out of the engine and Mr Belligerent pulled over onto the hard shoulder. Many gesticulations and head scratching followed and I was presented with the news that we would have to wait for two new buses to arrive as this one would need towing away. All the 90 people got off the bus and waited behind the safety barrier, trying to make the best of a bad situation. I can clearly remember hearing one nice person saying she couldn't organise a piss up in a brewery. And I just remember thinking, why the hell had I not organised that instead? I personally was absolutely dying for a drink by then. And I'm still not quite sure how that person figured that a bus breaking down was my fault, but hey-ho. I called the Benidorm Palace to tell them we would be arriving late. And they said, as, as there were so many of us, they would put the whole thing on hold until we arrived. I think we constituted about 80% of their audience that night. Finally. Two buses arrived, two new buses, two single deckers instead of the one double decker, and we all got on. Surely now we'd arrived without further incident. No, of course not. Everything comes in threes. As I realised when suddenly I saw that we were passing the skyscrapers of Benidorm on the right hand side, the driver had missed the turn off and the bus behind had followed him. We had to come off at the next exit, which I think was Calpe, and come back to Benidorm along the coast road another hour and a half, uh, sorry, another half an hour at least. We finally reached our destination at around half past 10 in the evening. And when we entered, we were greeted by a big round of applause. The audience that was already there was ecstatic that at last their evening could begin. I think the rest of the evening went well enough. Nice meal, good entertainment, as is the norm at Benidorm Palace. But to be honest, for me, it was all a blur and I was so stressed. I could not relax and enjoy it. At the end of the night, I was dismayed to see that the original bus driver had returned to take us home, Mr Belligerent, and I had to be talked into getting on the bus again by his lady friend. This time the journey went without incident and we finally arrived home in the early hours of the morning, exhausted and relieved to be home safely. The following week, I went to the bus company and put in a formal complaint. It transpired that Mr Belligerent should have been able to repair the problem on the motorway easily. It was a small thing. They did not understand why he had called for replacement buses. I gathered his lady friend might have been the reason for this. This way, he had an evening with just the two of them. However, he was in fact not allowed to take unauthorised people on his bus, so she should not have been there in the first place. He was suspended for three months. Apparently they wanted to sack him, but he was on a permanent contract and therefore they could not. And as compensation for my nightmare uh, experience, I was offered free transport to a place of my choosing for me and anyone else who was brave enough to go on another trip. This time I chose a meal and flamenco dancing in Tor Torrevieja, which is much closer to home. 
We had a great time, but it was the last trip I organised. I just could not face it again. <laughs>